Welcome to Gotta Talk. This is Will Sanchez. My very, very special guest today is Josh Pistin. He runs for the Staten Island Athletic Club, and he is also a member of the Prospect Park Trek Club. I am honored to have Josh as a guest. Thank you, Will. Nice Listen, to before here. we go into your multi-career here as a filmmaker, runner, a father, yeah. actor, whew, let's introduce yourself to our audience. Tell us where you were born, something about your childhood. I was born in Brooklyn, New York, uh, 1967, the summer of love. <laughs> and uh, in fact, uh, I think Sgt. Pepper's came out like maybe a week after I was born. And okay. it's one of my favorite CDs, uh, albums of all time. And then 14 years ago, I moved to Staten Island. My family bought a house, joined the Staten Island Athletic Club. Okay. Wait a minute, wait a minute. We skipped a whole bunch of stuff here. Yeah. This is a marathon, not a sprint. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So back in your Brooklyn days, yeah. did you have siblings to wrestle with? You know, yeah, my brother like? Aaron. Uh, he's uh, two years younger, but he's a few inches taller than me. So, so he probably won most of the fights then? Um, well, he was actually smaller um, at that time, so I won most of the fights. Uh, okay. I was usually the Tom and he was the Jerry, you know. <laughs> we, we broke a few things in our house when my parents were at home. Okay. Uh, more than once, and we had to actually repair all the vases and glass and stuff before they got home. We, we, we got good at doing that, actually. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> okay. Now, where did you go to high school? Sheepshead Bro Bay High School. Okay, in Brooklyn? Yeah, in Brooklyn. Uh, graduated in 84. Before I graduated, let's go back to 1980. It was, uh, I was 13 years old, and I saw my uncle Marty run the New York City Marathon back then. At that time, I never ran. I was 13, and I, you know, it inspired me. And I said, one day, I want to run the marathon. Uh, it took many years later for me to finally run it. I, I think I ran it the first, first time in 1995. 1995, yeah. okay. Yeah. So, so you went out to college, sounds like. What did you study in college? I studied uh, education, and I asked my father, like, halfway through my college career, like, you know, what I should do in my life, and he said, I'm very patient, I'm very organized, and why not teach? I'm like, yeah. And to this day, I'm still a teacher, oh, I and think, I love it. I think more than just a teacher, you're a sp special needs teacher? Right now, I'm a, a preschool special education teacher. I teach uh, three, four, and five-year-olds, and uh, it's actually an integrated class, half special, half regular. The whole idea is that the... Uh, the regular kids are role models for the special kids, and the special children actually learn faster because of that. Oh, what a great concept. Is, yeah. is that a common thing in uh, New York? or um, They're trying to integrate uh, special children as much as possible. Oh, that's great. Great. Yeah. That's interesting. I had Herbie Medina here sitting yeah. here, and he's a... Uh, He's a member of a different club, Urban Athletics, but I think he does a very similar thing. Yeah, he, he, he teaches preschool, too. Oh, yeah. oh, oh, in fact, I remember I saw a photo. You were supporting him at some cause. Yes, last year he was marching with his co-workers in Williamsburg. His school was going to close down. Okay. And so we, we, he invited me to, to assist him in a march, and I gladly helped him. You know. did, did the guy save the school? Or? Uh, yeah, I think he saved the school. Oh, yeah. excellent. Yeah, excellent. I brought my son, and it was, it was a great experience. That's interesting. You know, you said you've got patience, but I think... I think it's more in, in, into than that. You, you have to have some degree of empathy and, uh, and interpersonal skills. Yes. Now, where did that come from? Were your parents instilling you, you know, this, this love for mankind? Actually, my parents aren't as patient as me. I don't know where I got. I have tremendous patience. Uh, I think that's why I'm still married after over 20 years, 21 years now. I just uh, your wife would love to hear that. <laughs> <laughs> when I was a kid, I used to build 3,000-piece puzzles, okay? That's how patient I am. And now my son is doing that, you know? But he, he's, he got the, your patient Yeah, he's, he's 12 but years you, old. But your parents just skipped it. Yeah, exactly. It huh. must have went back one or two generations before them or something. Okay. Um, so I also, you also have to have vision as a teacher because you start the school year off with children who are delayed at this level. Sometimes the children I have begin with, they, don't, they can't even talk. You don't understand what they're saying. And then I know eventually, slowly but surely, they'll start improving their speech skills. By the time the, you know, the year's over, I, I, you know, I can understand them. Wow, and they can understand you. <laughs> yes, of course, yeah. Interesting, what age is these kids? Uh, three, four, and five years old. Oh my God, they were babies, yeah. three, four, five years old. And what's, this is pre-K, pre I guess. Yeah, pre-K. And what's funny is I'm the very first teacher they ever have. So in their minds, they think they're gonna have me for the rest of their lives. So there's, you know, there's one more, left, one more month left of school. Um, 
I'm starting to prepare them that you're not going to have Josh anymore. You're going to have go to another school with another teacher. Is, so, this, is this traumatic for them? Ah, uh, yes. Yeah, some of them, it's traumatic. They 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 look at me like ah, uh, he's joking. He's not. He, he's not really telling the truth. Yeah. We, so. at, at five years old, they're already a cynic, huh? <laughs> I mean, exactly. Joking. Yeah. Oh, interesting. So you have them for the whole day. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That could, I could see them bonding very well with you. Now, yeah. do they understand when you when you go out running? Do they they expect you to come back with? They send you the medals. Do they expect you to win? Or oh, something? the kids. Yeah. Yeah. I some we have show and tell every Wednesday. The kids can bring in an object from the house that they that they could talk about. I want to encourage them to talk in front of a group. That's the whole purpose. Sometimes I bring in my, my marathon medals and, you know, I show them, wrap them around my neck and they're like, oh, wow, did you win? And like, ah, I beat a lot of people. Uh, that's all I'll say about that. You know? So I saw you play an extremely important role in some of these. You're a pacer. Yes. And I mean, that's a really difficult task. How yeah. did you get into, into pacing? About four years ago, uh, the Road, New York Roadrunners Club contacted all the, ca uh, the captains of all the running clubs and they sent an email to them asking them if they uh, could share with their clubs uh, that they're looking for pacers. And I was interested in it. I, I, I didn't really, really want to uh, run competitively anymore. Um, I'm just kind of, I uh, just want to enjoy running. I don't want to, as you keep on breaking your PRs, it gets harder and harder and you could stress yourself out trying to break your previous times. Well, you so, got to wait for your next age group exactly. every five years or every ten years, whatever. I, I'm actually looking forward to turning uh, 50 in two years from now. Oh, okay, so. <laughs> the new PRs. Exactly. So I had to apply online uh, to show them my running history. I showed them a few marathons I ran, and to show that I'm great with pacing. And from that, you could say they hired me, but it's volunteer. So you know, uh, when I start my pacing gig at the beginning of the marathon or half marathon. All the uh, runners around me say, what happens if you don't pace properly? I'm like, well, they fire me. <laughs> well, first they have to hire you don't, me. You don't get your bonus. <laughs> no, right, exactly. Yeah, I, I had Michael Ring here, and he yeah. was a, a pacer back then. I don't know if at the same time era as you. Talking about Michael Ring, you did a very special project with him. Yeah. Tell us about Michael Ring and the, and the project that you did with him. Yeah, for people who don't know Michael Ring, My name is Michael Wing. I grew up in Brooklyn, New York. I went to Sheepshead Bay High School and graduated in 1981. I'm 51 years old. I have a wife and two teenagers, a boy and a girl. I love my family, Barack Obama, pizza, and writing my blog. And I love the Ramones. You see the guy sitting over there in the wheelchair? Well, that's me. Last year, I was diagnosed with a rare disease called CIDP. Professionals call it chronic inflammatory demyelinizing polyneuropathy. I call it hell. 12 months ago, before it got me, I was a marathon runner, a bike rider, and an all-around active guy. Now I can't even use a mouse anymore because I don't have control over most of my body. I can't hold anything in my hands. I can't open the door of a refrigerator. Not that it would help, since I can't really take anything out. I need to walk with a walker. That's what CIDP does to you. However, things could be worse. Others with this condition don't even survive. I try to be as positive as I can. Even though this condition has greatly affected my mobility, I refuse to give up, and I'll keep fighting the fight. One day I'll walk again, and I'll run my 30th marathon. Given my situation, I still try to enjoy my life as much as humanly possible. I still eat pizza, Obama is still my main man, and now I use my blog to show others who are suffering from CIDP that they are not alone. And I still love the Ramones. I'm a part-time filmmaker. You could say it's a hobby of mine. So I entered the Disability Film Challenge. It was a 48-hour film challenge where you had to feature someone disabled in the film. And I'm like, I could use Michael. I asked him. He loved the idea. The only thing is, this ch all these film challenges requires all these weird, has all these weird rules. Like for that one, I had to have him hold a balloon. Uh, he had to have a, a, a romantic interest in the film. All these crazy rules. I think Michael would have enjoyed that. <laughs> a romantic interest. 
And it couldn't be any uh, music that was um, already uh, a famous song in it, because I wanted to put his favorite group of all time, which is the Ramones. So I didn't want to stick to those rules, and I said, hell with it. Let me film it exactly how I want to do it. I, had, I wrote a script up. I wrote the words of how Michael should talk. He's going to narrate his own film. And he's like, I, you know, I sent this script to him beforehand. He's like, Josh, this is not real, me really talking like the real Michael Ring. I know it's, it's the actor Michael Ring portraying the real Michael Ring. Okay, so, <laughs> That's an interesting concept. Yeah, did he buy into that? Yeah, he did. But, uh, he, but I had him edit it first because he's, he's an atheist. And in, in the script, it says, thank God for, you know, that I'm still alive. And I had to edit that out. Okay. I changed the words around, okay. you know. All right, that's so, interesting. Yeah, so it turned out to be like a four-minute video, music video. Uh, it featured the Ramones music, and it turned out really well. In fact, the organization that uh, teaches people about CI and helps people with CIPD wanted to use that, that film as a motivating film to show others that they could still... Uh, you know, achieve their goals. I know. He, uh, Michael, uh, like you said, he was in a wheelchair motorized, but now he's actually, I guess only last week, you helped him finish the Brooklyn Half Marathon? Yep, this past Saturday. I gave up my pacing gig to be a, a Achilles guide for him. Me and Nic Nicoletta Naranjas, we both guided him uh, from the beginning to the end of the Brooklyn Half, and I brought my, my video camera with me. I filmed him from the very beginning, the, t the moment we picked him up at his house, all the way to the finish line in Coney Island. And I'm gonna, the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to edit it and make a sequel to last year's film, this time showing him running a whole half marathon instead of being bound into a wheelchair. But he actually walked it. I don't yeah, know. he walked he'd it. Walk yeah. and jog, walk and jog, something yeah, like that. He walked it, yeah. yeah. He did try to run fast the last... Uh, like 100 yards, and I got great footage of that. Great, and yeah. oh, and Nicoletta, she's wonderful. She probably kicked it off singing the national anthem? Yes, she did, yes. Because I had her here, yeah. and she kicked off this show singing the national anthem. Right, I saw that episode, yeah. She's wonderful. She's not my neighbor. She's your neighbor? Yeah. So what a small world. I know, I Because know. you live in Brooklyn now. Yeah, yeah. Okay, well, let's go back to the Staten Island Athletic Club, because yeah. you said you're one of the, uh, I guess you're the publicity manager? I'm the publicity director. Now, what, yeah. does a, what does a publicity director do? When we have our monthly meetings, which is the first Monday of every month, I try to gather uh, any kind of articles about particular members in our club that uh, talk about their lives. Anything that puts their name in the news, uh, local news, to highlight their lives. There may be something they did in, with running. It doesn't necessarily have to be um, something that they, you know, they were a fast runner. It could be something outside of running. Oh, yes, I think I, I seen SI Live. Is yeah. that one of the Staten Island? Staten Island Advance, that's their website, Their right? website, because I see, you know, they do all sorts of little articles. And I said, right. geez, I didn't realize all these people lived in Staten Island or worked in Staten Island or had yeah. an interest in Staten Island. In fact, one of our members, Lisa Swan, she just turned 49. She was uh, like 230 pounds uh, about less than two years ago, yeah. and she, she was uh, a couch potato all her life. She lost over 75 pounds the past 16 months, and that she joined our club two years ago, and uh, she's running races like crazy. She ran the Brooklyn Half this past weekend, and she is going to run her very first marathon in November. So the, they just put an article about her on the website today, and I'm going to present it at our next uh, club meeting. Ah, well, that's, that's yeah. great. I, I know other clubs do blogs yeah. and where they they obviously writing about their members doing things. So this is something similar. You're, oh, cool, yeah. cool. And then, and then you're also a member, you've got this dual membership with the uh, Prospect Park Track Club. Uh, why is that? My uncle Richard and Kathleen, they've been members forever of the PPTC, and uh, I, I'm friends with a lot of their members. I run in Prospect Park sometimes. They've been trying to get me to join for years. And I'm like, I've been in Brooklyn now for six years. I'm like, it's about time. So I joined last year, and um, you know, I'm dual membership, member of Staten Island Athletic Club and Prospect Park Track Club. You've People gotta pay double fees. Double uh, yeah, it's okay. <laughs> it's an investment because you know I'm able to run with them, hang out, make friends. It's, you know, it's, it's more than just running, oh, it's it social is, too. It is, yeah. and I adore 
the Prospect Park Track Club. I've had um, yeah. Michael Ring, as you know, Juan yeah. Seaforth, mm -hmm. and he was great. He's the biggest loser, too. He was, yeah. I don't think it was 260 pounds, but, you know, he was, a, episode, he was yeah. a whale, yeah. and now he's, uh, you know, a good, good runner. And because I'm a member of both clubs, I'm trying to uh, combine the clubs into fun events. This past January 1st, we've been doing the Polar Plunge for years now, Staten Island Athletic Club. They come... We've been doing it several years now. I finally got the PPTC to join us. My, their club president and my club president, they, we all went into the Atlantic Ocean and froze our butts off. Yeah, a lot of clubs do that. They go to Coney Island. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. I don't think I'm going to do that. <laughs> well, if you're crazy enough to be a runner, you know, might as well dive into the Atlantic yeah, Ocean uh, yeah, well, in the middle of the winter. Yeah, yeah. It's a, it's a good cause, I think. Now, you mentioned you're an actor. Yes. Or how did that uh, come about? And you got kind of interesting. Is that a birthmark or is that part of your acting? Uh, no, it is a birthmark. Trademark. Yeah, I, I've had it since I, since I came out of my mom's womb. Oh, okay. <laughs> Because, you know, that's big now because, yeah. you know, especially the last series of Star Trek, yeah. you know, the actors had to, you know, said, oh, this, I don't know what they call it, body uh, art. Yeah. So you got your own natural body art. Yeah, I'm used to it, you know. It's but a, did, did the kids make fun of you? Sometimes they did. I, I was able to, to handle it. I was able to survive. Well, you can say you look like a tough guy. Yeah, yeah. You know, we see the other, the other guy. Yeah, I can play a tough guy in the TV and film, you know. Oh, okay, well, let's talk about it. How did you get into the acting bug? Um, it actually started back in, I think, 1990. I was early 20s. Uh, Spike Lee was going to film Jungle Fever in uh, Bensonhurst. And he, uh, it was ba loosely based on that whole thing, that interracial relationship where the uh, African-American guy got killed, I think. Um, oh, yeah, crossing the street. In Is Howard the Beach, one? yeah. So anyway, he was looking for local Bensonhurst people, and I was a local Bensonhurst person. And I had a car. They wanted someone to drive through the scene. So I drive through the scene, and um, they, uh, they said they're having technical difficulties. So they, his assistant director put me in the scene. He said... When these ladies walk by, I want you to like look back and sneer at them. I'm like, okay, I could do that. So if you look at that episode, that that film, you'll actually see me, uh, a 20 year old Josh, you know, over. with the watermark, I mean, right. with the birthmark, I should say, watermark. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that's that's my very first film experience. And uh, now I've done over a hundred film and TV productions. Uh, I remember reading in one of your bios, you were a good-looking corpse in one of the uh, TV episodes. Yes, I was a fe the featured dead body of an episode of Law and Order uh, a few years ago. And, um, you know, it wasn't regular Law and Order, it was Special Victims Unit, so... Um, oh, with that actress, um, uh, what's her name? Mariska Hargate, yeah, she's hot. Mariska, yes, yeah, he's great. Yeah. He's the daughter of, of a famous actress. Yeah, I forgot her name. Jane Mansfield. Mansfield, yeah. Yes. Exactly. I basically played a dead guy, naked in bed. Um, they actually uh, covered up most of my behind. They, they, the networks, it was network TV, so I could show one inch of the man's butt crack, crack but the rule is, for women, it could be two inches, so. <laughs> so so you, they show an inch of your butt on the... Uh, yeah, they, yeah, they didn't actually take a ruler. They okay. didn't get... Okay. Obviously, the how, big fines that they went up to an inch and a half. Right, right. <laughs> Interesting. Well, yeah. how, do, how do you get a gig like that? Do, do they put out a good-looking corpse, need it, uh, show up? Or you gotta... That's exactly. Uh, one of the websites that me and my other, the other ba actors use is ba castingnetworks.com. We get most of our acting gigs in New York through that. And they were, it, it said they were looking for someone to play the dead guy, featured dead guy on, on the episode. So I submitted for it. They sent me an email back saying, we need to see more particular photos of you. And I'm like, what kind of photos? They said, like, <laughs> your backside, <laughs> but with your bottom covered by underwear, but you had to show an inch of the crack. You don't you get so, suspicious there? What kind of a, <laughs> what kind of a site is this? <laughs> they wanted to say, what, no, what it's, re it's reputable. Uh, okay. You know, there's all kinds of crazy stuff that they need for TV and film, you know? So anyway, the only person home at the time was my daughter. I couldn't take a selfie of me that way. So I'm like, Emma, come here. And she's like, what, Daddy? I'm like, you take a picture back there. I'm like, what? <laughs> and then I showed a little of the crack. She's like, Daddy, why are you doing this, you know? And I said, that's what they asked for, okay? And she said, by the way, don't tell any of my friends that, that you're going to be on the show because she didn't want to get embarrassed. Uh, uh, I think we, the cat is out the back here. How old is your daughter now? She's six, she just turned 16. I made sure I slipped her a $20 bill after, uh, after she did that. I, okay. That's like child abuse, practically, you know, okay. what I made her do. But to... I got the gig from that. From oh, well, there you go. She, yeah. she probably could get a cut of that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, so you exactly. have a 16. I think you also have a son, right? Yeah, 12-year-old son. 
Wow. Yeah. He plays piano. She likes art. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and they inherited, you said, your patience gene. Yeah. Yeah. They both have patience to different, different degrees. Um, they, they both were runners. My daughter was on Midwood High School track last year, but she just uh, got out of it. She's, she's pursuing art now. But, like, uh, like your dad. I'm like you. Yeah. La uh, last year, she was volunteering at the th three mile mark at the water station for her high school. I was pacing New York City Marathon. I knew she was going to be there, so I have this great picture of me and her taking a quick selfie. I had to give someone my pacer stick just to take that picture. And then as soon as I got the picture, I went back to pace my group. Oh, cool. You got to carry that, that sticky all the way? Yeah, it's, it's not that bad. Not that bad with your arms. Right. <laughs> now, you're probably wondering, like, when we have to go to the bathroom, what do the pacers do? I'll find someone who I'm pacing who's very consistent staying with me. I'll give them the, the stick. And then they're like, they get nervous. They're like, oh, no, I'm a pacer now? Yeah. I'm like, yeah, don't worry. Don't worry about it. The bonus. I try to do, you know. Your business. Do my business as soon as possible, you know. Uh, is that one of the qualifications? You've got to be able to do your business as soon as possible. Right, exactly. I, I love the check mark. <laughs> exactly. Oh, God. Exactly. Some of the pacers are very creative. Yeah. I, I saw one of the pacers, a woman, and she was, she was able to stick it into her hair. Yeah. And it looked like it's coming out of her head. Yeah. You know, she's able to run that way. I learned something about the pacers. There's over 70 pacers that uh, Roadrunners Cl Club has. They can't use them all at the same time. They use maybe mm, 20 of them. Um, but a lot of them, uh, lo like they're addicted to running. They'll find, they'll find any reason to run. And running could get expensive if you, if you do a race Especially like in New York, it's over $200. Yeah. A lot of them are fun people. Uh, I have this pacer friend named Joan Blackmore. She's from England. She actually puts a British flag on her pacer stick while, while she's running. Great. So. Great. Well, I have a, a funny pacer story for yeah. you. My wife did the, the mini 10K a mm -hmm. few years ago. Yeah. And they have pacers. Mm -hmm. One of the pacers was a male. Mm. And... For some reason, they recorded his time yeah. when he crossed the finish line. Right. He was the only male to show up in the results. Really? Bib. And he had to call in and say, no, no, cut, take me out because I'm male. When I'm not supposed to run. He was the only male because he was a pacer. He could have dressed up, you know. Uh, uh, could have. <laughs> well, I know people wear tutus right, out yeah. there. I guess that's... Yeah, uh, some of the, there's at least one pacer who wears a tutu every time, yeah. So the publicity director for Staten Island Athletic Club. Mm -hmm. How big a club is that, by the way? It's about 200 some odd members, more or less. Okay. And, yeah. I, and I, get, I guess uh, I had Matthew LeBeau here. Yes. He's a member? Uh, yeah, he's a member of our club. In yeah. fact, I think you were the one who referenced him to come yes. on the show. What a great guy. Exactly. Actually, that's part of my job. Uh, besides getting uh, publicity in local newspapers and stuff, I occasionally will get a good guest for you for your show. Oh. In fact, I have some guests. Got, in, in, oh, in, cool. Very I, yeah. cool. And yeah. then for Prospect Park, it's just one of the boys then. Yeah. Okay. Exactly. Great. Just, just a runner for them. Okay. You know? yeah. All right. Well, Josh, this is so interesting. What are some of your future challenges coming up? For example, professionally speaking, do you, do you have a part coming up in, uh, in any big blockbusters like the X-Men? Well, I'm a background actor, and background actors are not allowed to talk, okay? They get paid a certain um, scale. I'm, I'm actually a, me a member of the sag After Union, Actors Union. If I said one word, I would get several hundred dollars more, okay? But they give them those parts to uh, more seasoned actors, okay? I, I, I have a very busy life, and I can't, and I have a family and a house, and a real job, it's not easy being an actor. I know a lot of actor friends who survive off, off of this kind of work, and it's not easy. I know. So I don't want, you know. I so want you do it for fun. I do it for fun. It's a hobby for me. I want to stick to being a teacher. It's a great, great uh, career, you know. And uh, I, I get great feeling every year when I, I you know, reach yeah. the children. Oh, yeah. And, and how long have you been doing this, this, this teaching you? Uh, since the early 90s. 90s. So some of the kids are teenagers now that you... That oh, you, yeah. So did, did they come back and say thank you, yeah. Josh? Yeah, uh, last no, uh, December, I think he's now 18 years old, I think going to college. He made my day. He made my, my, my year. Uh, one of my old students, little pipsqueak when I had him. He's a full-grown adult now, and he's going to college. 18. Yeah. Wow. That, that's, me. 
you're taller than you. Look at yeah. that. That, that gotta gotta be very rewarding to see the the kids yeah. come back and remember them. Yeah. As little and it, and you probably they remember you as you know as part of the family. Exactly. Especially when you have them the whole year round for two or three years. Yeah. That's uh, that is a wonderful experience. Yeah. Okay, and then um, I guess you're going to continue pacing what, athletically. You, you got yeah, any yeah. I don't, I don't, I'm not interested in um, you know uh, competitively racing anymore. Uh, or breaking PRs. I, I, you could say I lost my running mojo. Uh, maybe it'll come back one day. So for now, I want to have fun with running, be a pacer, get to run the race for free, get that medal, you know. Um, and I get a lot of, uh, you know, great feedback from total strangers when I pace them. Well, yeah. which group do you pace usually? I mostly do half marathons, and I pace, I'm usually a two-hour pacer. Sometimes I'm on 155 pace. Oh, yeah, the sub two, you know, that's important for them. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you're very, very happy. Last year in the Brooklyn half, I did 159.59. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah. Well, that's probably why they keep having you come back year after year after year because pacing's not easy. It's not easy, yeah. And now, some paces are talkers and some are, you know, very studious. Which, which one are you? I'm a talker, yeah. I, um, I actually, besides providing the runners with information about each mile, whether they're ahead or behind, in pace time, I, uh, I say st a lot of stupid jokes. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Will you, can you close out the show with uh, one of your favorite clean jokes? Clean? <laughs> Put you on the spot. Well, here. when I was, uh, when I did my last publicity uh, report, because um, that, that's when I practiced new jokes, running related joke, did you see the uh, the blind runner who finished the 5K? No. He didn't see you either. <laughs> All right. On that note, thank you so much for coming in, Josh. You're welcome. It's thank a you. Pleasure. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure. Thanks.